Um, yes, so as Takashi introduced, I'm now going to talk about the inclusive semi-tonic decays. Instead of looking at the um, beauty sector, I'm looking at the charm sector. And as you can see, this is um, a collaboration between the JLQCD group represented by Takashi, uh, Shoji Hashimoto, and myself. And the RBC UK QCD group represented by Andreas Jutna and Alessandro Barone. And sadly, I don't really have an overview slide of what I'm going to talk about, but I guess that kind of keeps it interesting since we don't know what's coming next. Um, but let me start with a short introduction and an overview. So as you can already guess from my title, I'm interested in calculating the inclusive decay rate on the lattice. And the basic idea here is that on the lattice, we can calculate four-point correlator functions where we insert two currents at two different time slices and we allow all different um, final states, which we denote by x, to exist between these currents. So, um, but all of these different states have to be weighted over and this k factor, which um, we, uh, I don't have the pointer anyway. Um, so the violet k, which we later call the kernel function, contains the um, kinematics and this k requires some approximation which is obviously a source of systematic error. And this systematic error is the focus of my work. We want to understand the systematic error and possibly reduce this. Uh, ah, yeah. And possibly reduce this. So um, um, additionally, this work also is used to validate um, the whole concept of applying lattice QCD on the lattice for, in uh, lattice QCD for inclusive decays. And um, once we have understood all the systematic errors, we also want to compare this, obviously, to experimental data, for example, from the BEST3 collaboration. At this point, I just want to mention two um, different works that are going on in parallel to what I'm doing. One is the work from Alessandro Barone from the UK QCD group, who is comparing the Chebyshev and the Bacchus Gilbert approach. So there exist two different ideas, or there are two different ideas proposed to treat inclusive decays on the lattice. One is the Chebyshev approach, which is the one I'm using in this work. And there's also the Bacchus Gilbert approach um, proposed by Maxwell Hansen's group, which um, I don't really know exactly what they are doing, but they are basing their approach on the Bacchus Gilbert approach. And Alessandro Barone's work is focusing on a comparison between these two methods. Additionally, the Italian group around Paolo Gambino, represented by Antonio Smecca, is looking at the inclusive decays of the um, B meson, which uh, with a focus also on comparing their results to OPE results. So if you get the chance to listen to either of these talks, I wholeheartedly recommend doing that. And um, next, let's start with what I'm actually doing with a little theoretical framework. So, as per usual, the object that's giving us trouble um, and we somehow have to approximate is the hadronic tensor, which contains all the different, uh, all our non perturbative information. And in this case, I've already um, inserted the complete set of states, but this is really just to show what it looks like. So, um, starting from this, we can see how this contributes to the total decay rate. So, the total decay rate for the limit of massless neutrinos can be relatively straightforwardly calculated and written down like this. Here, we introduce our notation x bar. This x bar contains the whole energy integral, which is shown here. And this one can be rewritten in such a way as shown in the blue box down below. So that in this case, we implicitly contain the integral in this matrix element where we allow all the different states to exist between the two currents. So this x bar basically becomes our gateway to um, calculate our total decay rate, because once we have the expression for x bar, doing the integral over q squared is relatively straightforward, and then we can compare our results to experiments. Um, but this expression by itself for the inclusive decay doesn't really help us much. So let's take a look on what we can do on the lattice. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, on the lattice, we can try to do this by using four-point correlation functions, which I've sh schematically shown here where we have two current insertions at time slices t1 and t2. But um, the problem with this four-point correlator as it is, is that we can't really extract usable information. We also need the two-point correlation functions for, in my case, d sub s meson. And then we can create a ratio like this. 
um, which then allows us to extract uh, forward scattering matrix elements of this form. And this basically then correlates to our data for different time slices t. So once we have this expression from our lattice data, we can take a look between this expression and the expression we just derived for the energy integral in the inclusive rate. And if we look at it, we see that it should be possible to um, approximate x bar if we can write down our kernel function k in terms of the polynomial in exponentials. So basically what we're doing is we assume some approx uh, polynomial approximation for our kernel function, insert this in these matrix elements, and then we can see that x bar can be approximated by using our lattice data since all of these different matrix elements just corresponds to our lattice data for different time slices t. What we're effectively doing in this way is instead of trying to find an approximation for the um, hadronic tensor, we can now directly calculate the energy integral with our lattice data. So, so once we have this um, nice approximation, the next question obviously is, what's the best way to approximate this? Um, and some intelligent people in the past have shown that the best polynomial approximation for a given range of uh, omega can be given by the Chebyshev approximation. In our case, we are using the modified, or I guess in the literature they are mostly called the shifted Chebyshev polynomials, to construct an approximation of our kernel function, which looks like this. So I'm going to talk about the coefficient cj in a little bit later, but the um, Chebyshev uh, polynomials, tj star, the first couple of um, polynomials I've given here but the main takeaway for this one is basically just that the Chebyshev polynomial of order j always corresponds to a polynomial of the same order. So now that we have a possible way to approximate our kernel function, the next question is how do we choose our kernel function? The easiest or the most naive um, way to do this would be to choose our kernel function to be a heavy side step function. This will allow us to easily implement our upper limit of the integral and this is shown on the right-hand side. So here we have in blue the heavy side step function and the corresponding Chebyshev approximation for two different choices of polynomial order n. So here we have n equals 5 and n equals 20. But at this point you already see a kind of disturbing behavior, which is that if we just increase the order from n to 5 equals 20, we already start seeing oscillations um, around the threshold. Now, this behavior obviously is not desirable, and it becomes even worse for higher orders of n. So throwing our Chebyshev approximation directly at the heavy side function doesn't seem like a feasible idea. So the next step to do this, or the next step to treat this, in our case, is um, we stabilize our approximation by introducing a smearing to our kernel function, so that instead of trying to approximate the heavy side function directly, we are trying to approximate a smeared sigmoid function. Now, this is shown on the lower left side here. Uh, I apologize for my color coding since uh, I guess using just two colors might have not been very efficient. But um, I show two different sigmoid functions which are the solid line. So we have a green solid line which corresponds to a smearing of 0 0.2 and we have the orange solid line which corresponds to a smearing of 0 0.05. Um, both of them are approximated with the same number of polynomials chosen before. So for the broader smearing, we choose n equals 5, and for the smaller smearing, we choose n equals 20. And we already see that our approximation becomes a lot smoother, and um, the approximation itself seems to fit the sigmoid function quite well. Now, so that this is a possible choice for our kernel function, but by doing it like this, we introduce an additional um, problem that we have to solve later on, which is, instead of just having to take the order of the Chebyshev polynomials of n to infinity, we now also have to take the um, smearing of the kernel function to zero, so that this introduces a di an additional component to our systematic error. But um, this is the price we have to pay to obtain a reasonable approximation. So that now, let's talk about um, the final uh, slide for the Chebyshev approximation. Namely, we write down our um, omega integral approximation by using the Chebyshev. So here we have um, the energy integral we wish to approximate. We define our states psi, which um, 
basically define the states on which we evaluate our kernel function. And on the right-hand side, you see our Chebyshev approximation. So um, we have the coefficient cj, which in the case of omega 0 equals 0, with omega um, being defined like this. So let me make a comment on the choice of omega 0. So omega 0 basically corresponds to the limits of our integrals. Omega 0 equals 0 means we try to approximate the energy integral from 0 to infinity. But um, these coefficients, as well as the actual um, form of the ch shifted Chebyshevs, depend on the choice of that lower limit. So um, if omega 0 is not 0, our, our Chebyshev polynomials, as well as our coefficients, look slightly different. I don't have the time to go into details towards that, but this is treated in the talks from Alessandro Barone. So um, once again, I recommend listening to his talks. And additionally, we have the Chebyshev matrix elements shown here, which we can approximate or we can basically fit from our lattice data by using a constraint fit. This uses a property from the Chebyshev um, approximation, namely the one that all the Chebyshev matrix elements have to be bound in the range of minus one and one, so that um, we can fit our lattice data to the Chebyshev matrix elements using this constraint, which allows us also to suppress the statistical noise for large orders of J, for which we assume that we see huge cancellations. Additionally, this very property can also be used to estimate the error in our Chebyshev approximation, but um, I will talk about how we approximate the error a little bit later, um, but I will come back to this. So that once we have a way to write down our energy integral, let's see and um, let's talk about our lattice setup on which we generate our data. So I'm using, a da um, we are conducting our study with the JLQCD ensembles used in the, pub used in the publications from Brian. I I'm sorry, I just can't, cannot pronounce his name, so I'm just going to call him Brian. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> and um, we are using this ensemble down here. So, um, yeah, it's basically the same one. I, I want to save you of just reading down all the numbers, but the important points, I guess, are that we simulate the S and C quarks at nearly physical values. And we choose four and we have four choices for the momentums ranging from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. All of them are given in, um, in orders of 2 pi over L. Our numerical computations are conducted here at the Fugaku machine. And our data is generated by using the grid and hadrons um, software packages. So with this setup of our lattice data, Yes, so let's take a look at the first preliminary results we have. So in this plot, I show um, our approximation for x bar for a choice of Chebyshev polynomials n equals 10 and the smearing on our kernel of 0 0.1. Um, you can see that we are using this relation for, um, for on how to set our smearing. Um, it's shown, the reason is shown on the next slide, but I guess it becomes quite obvious since we have to take the n to infinity and the sigma to zero limit, this relation allows us to take both of these limits simultaneously. So that's why we choose to set um, our choice of the smearing like this. And here you see four different points. So we decompose our x bar into four different contributions. Depending on the choice of whether we have um, vector current or axial vector current insertions denoted by v and a respectively, and additionally, we further subdivide them by parallel and perpendicular, depending on whether the inserted current is parallel or perpendicular to the inserted momentum. Um, finally, this plot also contains the dashed line shown here, which is um, a comparison value for a VV parallel from D2K data, which was um, provided to me kindly by Takashi. I don't know if this data is published, so I don't have a reference for it, but... Uh, yeah, he sent it to me, so I, I'm using it here. Um, <laughs> I, I trust him. <laughs> uh, so, but um, we see that our values for XVV parallels seem to be in the right ballpark, except for our largest momentum insertion, where we see rather large discrepancies between XVV parallel and XAA parallel. And in the next one, I want to focus on XAA parallel, um, and also introduce the method or the first idea on how we elevate uh, 
estimate our errors. So for X AA parallel, um, at momentum insertion 111, we know that this only receives contributions from the vector meson state. But we also know that at this specific choice, the lowest energy state is already above our kinematical threshold. So obviously, we would expect that X AA parallel at this, in this case to be zero. As you've seen in the plot before, that's not the case. So yeah, here I once again show why we take our choice for sigma. And um, here I now ex show how we try to estimate the error. So as I mentioned before, the Chebyshev matrix elements have to be bound between minus one and one. And we know that for high orders of J or high orders of the polynomial order, our fit basically just returns our inserted prior of zero and plus minus one. So we take our choice to estimate the maximum mathematical error by just assuming that each of the Chebyshev matrix elements has the same sign as the corresponding CJ, and we just add up the absolute values of these CJs as our error bars. This is done here, and now you might ask yourself, um, we don't see any error bars in this specific plot. Well, this is um, due to the very specific case of XAA parallel, which is illustrated on the right-hand side. So here we show our kernel function, and in gray, we have our integration area, which we choose from omega zero to infinity. So it goes beyond the picture. But we see that for n equals 10, we are strongly overestimating the um, actual integral, which would be zero. And this is reflected in, in the inclusive data. But for n equals 100, the area at which we overestimate the integral becomes a lot smaller, and that's um, shown here. Now, as for the reason why we don't see an increase in the error bars, that's due to the fact that um, for, these, for this specific choice, the Chebyshev coefficients um, descend towards zero very quickly. So our cutoff order for um, at which point we start introducing this error estimate is n equals 10. So for all Chebyshevs larger than 10, we add these coefficients um, as an error bar. But that just means that for this choice, already at n equals 10, the coefficients are already close to zero so that we don't see an increase in error bars. But this is really just a feature for XAA parallel where we are just trying to approximate zero. So this basically just shows us that we can approximate zero in a, in a good way. Um, now, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> I haven't looked at the... Three minutes. Few minutes, great. <laughs> um, yeah, so next let's take a look at the n to infinity limit. Well, it's not really the n to infinity limit, it's just a comparison between n equals 10 and n equals 100. And um, this plot I showed before, and on the right-hand side you see the same plot for n equals 100 and corresponding for uh, the smearing of 0 0.1. Uh, 0 .01. The takeaway for this specific plot is that our central values between the two plots remain quite stable, and um, we see a huge increase in the error bars. Well, obviously, th these error bars are an overestimation, which is due to the fact of how we estimate the error. We assume that the Chebyshevs are always plus minus one, just to assume, um, just to get an error estimate. While this is um, mathematically a robust way to estimate the error, it's just really the maximum error which we can expect. So our real error would be somewhere in between these lines. We won't be living on, on the edges, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, now, but a proper estimate for these errors requires knowledge on the actual spectrum of what we are looking at. So because um, if we have a flat spectrum, we assume that um, all the errors from below and above the threshold would largely cancel, so we expect very small errors. But that's not the case if we have a rapidly changing spectrum, which in that case, which for example, close to the ground state, um, we would expect larger errors just because a rapidly changing spectrum is harder to properly catch. Well, but talking about the spectrum, this basically um, comes down to the problem of the finite volume effects, which, um, I'm going to talk shortly about here, since this is currently work in progress. Um, we can't talk, I can't talk too much about this. But um, yeah, as I just mentioned, in the case of the infinite volume, we have a continuous spectrum and everything is 
fine or at least under control. But on the finite volume, we just have a lot of different delta peaks. So this um, causes some problems for us. So we try to do a little case study where we assume um, our spectrum to be something like this, which we can just assume for the um, free, two free two body decay. Um, and we can easily write this down for the infinite volume case and the finite volume case. With these two, we can now calculate um, rather straightforwardly the integral for a specific range, which is shown here. So we have in black the infinite volume integral um, using this uh, spectrum. And the step function you see here is just obtained by using this and evaluating on the heavy side function. So we see um, the step function we would expect. The interesting part is if we now apply a small smearing to this, uh, to our finite volume approximation, you can see that instead of a step function, we see a rather smooth function. So applying the smearing kinds of washes out the finite volume effects. And um, the basic idea that we have is that for very large choices of the threshold value, so where we cut off our integral, the um, finite volume sigmoid function and the infinite volume integral kind of converge to, to the same value. And um, at this, the idea is then to extrapolate backward from somewhere up here to our physical threshold value, which, is, which lives somewhere in this region. But um, this is really just, a, this example shows that it works but um, it's really just a very simple example. So once we include the real kernel function, it might look different. And once we include errors, it might look different again. So um, this looks very nice, but we don't know if it works perfectly once we include real data and go toward more realistic examples. Um, and I think with this, I'm basically at the end. Um, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave the summary slide out here because I don't know uh, if I'm over time. Uh, yeah, thank you.